think that there is some research, I'm not pretty sure about it, but I think that there is some research that has looked at, yeah, there are some hormonal changes, actually, <laughs> uh, changes in the, product, in the secretion of oxytocin um, if people are engaged in, yeah, in passionate interaction with another being. It's usually a baby, but of course it doesn't have to be. Uh, it could be another animal. <laughs> Um, so yes, there are, there is some evidence that, that we do change biologically in the process of interacting with another, whether that other is. Um, but I, I, you started off saying you, from the Consuelo's devil's advocate position, and, and it, so yeah, I'm not I, quite I, sure what I was question. just trying to grasp really like, um, I mean like everything starts off with a question, can you I mean, can you feel the pain of the animal? Of course you can't no. in some ways, but in some ways you might be able to relate to it and this form of relation might be something that is not purely subjective. That's maybe the starting point of my, where my argumentation would start. Right. So I was actually wondering, because if you're saying it's, object, it's completely subjective, you can never speak for the animal. It's not possible. Because it's right. only always your position, you're completely captured in your own perception. But if we could say that there is something that makes us share with others, and okay. that this can be put down, then we could maybe get to another point. I think the problem then is the, how we understand <coughs> what subjectivity is. You know, um, if we mean it's only something in here, then that is, in some sense, is only available to me. You can't know it, you can't know it. But I think, yes, there probably is something, maybe there is a little kernel of that, but I think it, it, it can also be meant. Some people are using the word also to mean something which is shared. And that is, that is the kind of root of compassion. And we're just not good enough, at least in English, um, at, at explaining those differences. The subjectivity is partly about what's in here, but it's also about maintaining connection. And that's the contrast with the kind of objectivity that feminists have criticised, because it's precisely uh, what Haraway calls the dog trick, the standing apart from, that we don't want to be involved with. So what we want is something which is engaged. And if, if you're not going to be that distant kind of objective, then the only other word available in English is subjective. And that's where it starts to get muddy. And we don't, that's why Sandra Harding actually differentiated between what she called strong objectivity and weak objectivity. Uh, weaker objectivity is what scientists usually do. Strong objectivity would be where you, do, you actually take into account the position of the knower, the situatedness of the knower. Um, and then you can, you can you, in a sense, you can stand apart because you know the position you're standing in. So that slightly makes the, the concept of objectivity a bit less, I don't want to know that. But, so we've got to think that we still need to do a lot more work on that notion of objectivity and therefore, almost by default, how that defines and positions subjectivity. But it's difficult. I agree, yes, there is a problem because it's, to use the word subjectivity does tend to make you think of Oh yeah, just my experiences in him, which you're not going to be party to. You don't know what I'm feeling at the moment. Giants. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> on my part, I would think that uh, uh, subjectivity is like directly linked to human interpretation. So if you want to have some quantification, something objective about, uh, um, for example, animal pain. Um, I would, for me, I would put apart this uh, this, uh, this subjectivity and this human interpretation. Uh, for example, if I uh, in, a, in a dangerous situation, I would uh, see a dog run for survival. I can also um, see that a, a human would run for survival. And what what I feel at that moment, I can say that, uh, for example, that dog, well, will have this rush of adrenaline, will have this uh, this. Uh, this tension, this uh, urge to, to go away, and well, the, the, the problem is if you, you try to include interpretation and thoughts and culture and whatever that you can build 
uh, upon it, then it becomes difficult to interpret how the animal, uh, what the animal feels. But sure. if you remove that part, that is our interpretation and is uh, a particular to each uh, person, well, you have a kind of objectivity. And then, okay, maybe you can say that the dog fears, but anyway, he ran, he ran away for, for survival, and we are able to do the same. So, I, 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 I feel like it's, um, the, the difficulty uh, uh, raises from the, the, the intention to include this interpretation in the animal behavior. If you remove it, if you, if you can just see that animals are as we are, we, we behave the, the, the same than the, the, the ex animal, well, you remove the subjectivity and you have a, an objective interpretation. Yes, I think this, the, it, it again comes back to this problem of, of how you talk about subjectivity. I mean, I think that the way in which uh, Françoise Wemelsfelder is talking about it, she's talking about it to include the animal's feelings. So what you're, what you're saying is that the, it's okay, we can talk about animals having feelings. The animal, will, we can say, that's frightening. Actually, when I was an undergraduate learning animal behaviour, you weren't even allowed to say that. You only could say and do what you could observe. To say the animal was frightened was that subjective. You see, it's the subject, your subjectivity, and you're attributing subjectivity to them, and you weren't allowed to do it. So that it, it is that sense of yeah, the person, my personal feelings. We can't talk about that. But yeah, you're you're quite right. It's the animal emotions that we can recognise. We can be empathic with. Um, and that's important because we can recognise this in ourselves. It may take a slightly different form, but it's that empathy which matters. I, I, you know, we can argue about precise definitions of subjectivity. In a way, I think that's going off too much of a tangent, though, because what I think I would really want to emphasise more than anything else is I don't want to see a separation, either in theory or in the methodologies that we use between us and other animals. I want to try to break that down. That's, you know. <laughs> For me, we should remove the, even the, the word human. It's like animals. Yeah. Just study them and not make a difference. Yeah. That's it. But that is tricky because there's lots of things about, like, concepts of human rights. Well, <laughs> well we should apply the same rights to the animals. Oh, well, yes. It doesn't matter. Well there's a whole lot of yeah. literature on that. <laughs> it's a principle of precaution because we don't know sure. what they feel, yeah. you know. So before doing the worst, we should just stop doing bad, you know. Yeah. Yeah, it's interesting what you say because really, I don't know that anyway. Because if we talk about human rights and we talk about you know, freedom, basically, <laughs> we have problems with pets and all everything that we we, we think that we we are the owners so. of animals too, so that would be the, the previous problem. I would like to ask you, um, because I'm not from, from the area of, of, of this kind of sciences, or neither from social sciences, I'm coming from law, that's pretty, it's not a science, I think. Um, and I think that uh, somehow what happens with, uh, even in, in law, with gender studies in, in law, is that that we are doing all the time this, um, showing that the reality has much more complexity than than the the, the rules or the the, or the structure or the sciences has have usually been open to recognize. So I think that somehow that complexity is also the problem for, for gender studies in, in many areas. That it's a complexity that somehow is not accepted socially. And I mean, when you need an article for to the newspaper, and, and people want, uh, you know, biological determinism, and, and, and they want to know that the cats are good for your mental health, or anything like that, you know, yeah. it's interesting, but, but um, and I think that somehow it's, there's like, this, and feminist studies in general have, have been um, making more complex analysis always, that somehow I think that even even now from 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 academy and, and, and from the social world there's a resistance. It's like the, the modern model and we have we want 
and cause and consequences, and, and then understand everything in a very linear way. And, and it's like, an, an, I don't know, and how do you say, what do you, how do you see that? Because I feel it's, it's not just in, in social sciences and, and, and biology or in law, it's everywhere. I think that's right. That's why I, I try to say I don't think it's only a feminist question. I, there are a lot of people who try to put things into wider context, but we're always fighting against this tendency to want to try to simplify things. I have come across articles where people ask if we are inherently dualistic. <laughs> Which is an interesting idea, although I don't like the word inherently. But um, we do have a tendency to want to think in linear ways and dualistically. <laughs> It's true, but that, you know, you could also look at the history of, of Western thought, too, and trace its roots, so <laughs> not all human cultures are as dualistic. I just wanted to make one comment, it's not <laughs> to cause anything. Um, no, I just remembered the, the film Avatar, which, you know, you might be against it or you might say it's just fiction, but uh, I think it, um, this embodiment of the people in the planet, I don't remember the name, um, they, they are interrelated, they are interconnected. Um, every human being or native um, with the so-called animals there plus the, the jungle and the big tree at the center but they are all connected I mean one dies a bit of someone dies as well so I think that's probably what you were trying to say I just wanted to comment on, on that film I think I want to see it again. <laughs> I, um, yeah, one, of the th one of the things that I perhaps didn't emphasise enough is that we don't yet have methodologies that enable us to see relationships between two or more entities, individuals, creatures, um, as somehow more than some of the parts. What we do tend to always go back into is methodologies that are looking at you know, I move towards you, you move towards me, or what they interview you, or... We need something which is looking at, it's almost like a, a, a field of action. It is something that is around all of us. It sounds a bit mystic, but actually that, that's why I like the idea in animal de uh, embryonic development of morphogenetic fields, for precisely that reason. It's something which is actually bigger than... And we really are rubbish at finding ways of looking at those interactions within some wider context. Mm. And that's precisely what you were talking yeah, about, that's, that's that's about. That's empathy of the emotions. That's why I wanted to have your opinion and, and asking you uh, if, um, uh, for example, understanding um, environmental principles really deeply, um, on your opinion, if it doesn't uh, lead to, uh, to a kind of anti-matrix anti considerations. Anti-machist anti considerations, because, uh, for example, even Einstein said something like she said that uh, the investigator is always part of the in investigation, yeah. or or some morphogenetic fields. If you go deeply, deeply in the understanding of nature, yeah. uh, well, you understand that you can't be that uh, only dualistic, or you know, yeah. like th that uh, um, uh, hermetic to to. Uh, to influence of the whole, you know, yeah. uh, or it, even when you're uh, talking about in, in interdisciplinarity, for example, in, in biology, ecology, and the sciences of the environment, they yeah. felt the need to to, to join uh, different uh, practices and sciences because uh, if, if not, there would be some limit. Yeah. So it, it brings to to something quite anti-capitalist, anti-machist, more open, more more communicative, more uh, more sharing. That is for me anti anti matches as we identify. Yeah, and I, I agree, and that's where my heart is. Though I recall um, something that um, a, a late colleague of mine 
Brian Goodwin wrote. He was a developmental biologist who, you know, thought along these more holistic lines. Uh, but I remember him writing that there is no science of the whole organism anymore. It's got so superseded with the search for the genome, and the et cetera, et cetera, uh, and molecular biology. But if you, and this was certainly true at Warwick when I was teaching there, the whole of the biology department was about molecular biology. They talked a little bit of ecology and that was it. But it was basically molecular. And there was no, there, I, mean, I agree with him actually, there is no science of the whole organism anymore. We don't tend to think of whole organisms. There is a bit of uh, holistic medicine that is uh, rising. Yeah, but even that gets a bad press. I mean, yeah. you know, people yeah. talk about it as though it's complete rubbish. <laughs> Let's be honest, the reductionism has had its uses because obviously by looking at, at fine causes, um, then we, you know, the whole of the way that, um, there's lots wrong with Western medicine, let, uh, you know, of course, I'd be the first to admit. But on the other hand, if you find out that a particular molecule um, is involved in the development of, for example, Parkinson's disease, then you can maybe find something which helps people who are suffering from Parkinson's disease. So, of course, reductionist um, approaches to biomedicine have been hugely useful, but they become too dominant. They, we no longer can see the rest of the context well enough. And yes, I mean, I think there's... And, and, and even I think it's dangerous because even if they find a, a very efficient molecule, well, they don't really measure the, the, the consequences, you know, the second effects and things like this, and it always, always depends on the context of the, something larger, you know, than the, the only the, the one molecule. Yeah. Sure, I, no, I completely agree with you. That, to me, that would be good biology. Yeah. But that often gets forgotten. <laughs> or rather, what biologists will almost always tell you is but that, that we always do think that there's a lot more involved, but not in the papers that they publish. If you read the papers that are published, the majority, that's what the dominant hegemonic kind of position is that molecules call this is likely to be a, it's the way that it's written. So that, I think that's part of the problem. And what do you think is the main problem um, for interdisciplinary studies, really? That we don't, you don't get grants for that, but, but what, which are the reasons at the end? What do you think? Huge mistrust. Um, I have to say that I get a lot of mistrust from scientists because I also do sociology of science. <laughs> so, no, was it? No. <laughs> well, not the kind of sociology of science I do. Um, and, you know, they really, they think that you're, oh, you're being too subjective, it's that word again. Oh, it's all full of anecdotes. Oh, no, it's, it's a regular sociological study based on interviews, ethnography. And they, they simply don't understand. So I think that the biggest problem is, is not just whether or not you're going to get the money, but where, where you're going to publish the stuff. Because that's why I use that example of the Catalan metaphor and the English metaphor. You are actually talking different languages which say different things. You know, it, it is very difficult. That doesn't mean to say we shouldn't try. We should, but I just, it is very, very difficult. There are, there are some journals that are a bit more progressive and will try to include. I think that's Partly why I like working in human animal studies, there are there is more scope for including studies that are scientific and studies that are more sociological or legal, <laughs> all in the same journal. Um, but not that common. <laughs> it, it, it isn't easy. Well, I, I, I just wanted to, to tell you a couple of comments. Is, uh, the, um, uh, no, it's just that I'm in the fondo. What's your name? I'm in the fondo, if you have a micro. I can speak louder. <laughs> <laughs> well, the first one is about the, your situated knowledge, in the sense that I do, I do see it very, it's very obvious to me 
what you are situated in knowledge, no? Because on the first hand, it's one of the first the academical talks that I, I have been, that I've listened something about animals, animals related to human, no? And, and I think this is very specific, I mean, of, or, or maybe it's, it's Spanish culture that we are not still there, that animals are not, uh, it's not on the table, it's, uh, it's, it's another status of, of beings. And, and, and I have found it very refreshing, the, your, your presentation. And, and the second is because I'm an environmental sociologist, and I and I'm also I think of myself also as, as a feminist. And I also had a lot of doubts that I'm doing a PhD, and, and I, I, I ask to myself, am I doing something about feminism, or am I feminist? But who's talking to me? Is this feminist, or, or have you thought of including some feminist aspects or something? And and now I mean I've seen that I mean. Uh, now I think I have much more things like clear after seeing you know that it's about accountability, about contextualization, it's about uh, I think very imp an important part is, is to, to, to take into account this, the consequences of your research also the, the consequences of what you are going to do with that, what's, how it's going to impact and on all these things. And so thank you very much. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Can you tell us something more about your next project, project project? So the, because you have proposed a lot of uh, questions on how to Well we're still trying to work out the methodology. <laughs> <laughs> but do you have any you, there is something you want to try? Well again you see I think we are going to end up splitting uh, some of the very scientific stuff off. I mean, it's, it's very difficult because of who you work with. Um, we are partly doing a, a study of, um, we're trying to get at thinking about the horse-human relationship in the context in which it becomes difficult. And what happens is, it certainly in English-speaking culture in, in the UK and, um, I don't know, actually in Spain too, there's, there's a a development of something called, called in English natural horsemanship. Um, and this is what well, the people who are involved in the different forms of natural horsemanship, there are various forms, but all of them say that they are using methods which are better for the horse, that they learn to speak horse, that traditional people in horse, horsey worlds. Uh, don't know this, and, but ultimately the people who are involved in these new methods, they're not really doing anything new, and they're setting themselves up as separate from, different from, the traditional world. And what in that context, you've got a, a, an increasing number of behaviour consultants. Also true for dogs too. There's an increasing number of people who claim to be behaviour consultants. Now sociologically it's very interesting because in the UK there is now a big fuss being made about um, whether or not dog owners should listen to or pay any attention at all to Caesar Milan. Does anyone know who Caesar Milan is? He's an American, um, he, 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 he has his own show called The Dog Whisperer on American TV. And he's become very famous on American television and he's come over to, to the UK. And he's very, very controversial because some of his methods involve kind of effectively punishing the dog, rolling it over, pushing it around and things. So I'm told, I haven't seen this TV program. Um, on television? In Molecular in, in Biology, for example, in environment. And, Oh, other question. Other, I, I'm worried about uh, how to drop the because sometimes it's not sitting in the, in the fence. It's uh, it's like a paranoid uh, life 
when you do violin, for example, and think about feminist uh, critics of science, you, you, you are not in, in, in the top looking at, you are really separated. Then the question is how hard it is to try to do methodologies that include or uh, I, I don't I don't know how to explain but it's about uh, how how uh, our methodologies can can include our feminist uh, questions and uh, broke the um, situation at the universities, for example, in biology areas, because at the universities the people absolutely uh, disagree with the, the critic of, uh, of the, they are very close about the objective of science. Then it's it's uh, it's hard to include that, that aspect. I'm sorry. <laughs> My first response to that is that I think the Catalan metaphor actually works rather better because swimming under the weight, you don't have to look up and pull the last yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, It's in between two. Yeah. yeah, but you can be underwater. You can still see a lot. <laughs> um, yeah. I think I've always, that my personal thing is, I've always been fairly pragmatic. I think you have to do several things at once. You can't any. We, we don't have a feminist society, yeah. <laughs> to say the least. Um, you know, we, we took a few steps forward, but we've taken many steps backwards. So in England, I don't know about Spain, but we've taken many steps backwards in the last few dec couple of decades um, in terms of women's achievements. So I think you you do have to be pragmatic, and sometimes I think there may be a case. It's not like this is not the ideal. But there may be a case for just quietly doing research which is feminist and just not telling some of these colleagues about it. You can still publish that in multiple journals. Some of it you may publish under a slightly, you know, change the word slightly, and then you can publish it in, some, in a different form in a journal that's more sympathetic. So I think you have to be pragmatic, but it is difficult. It will always be difficult. There will always be people, and especially, as you know, around the sciences, they do tend to be, does tend to be more resistance among some scientific colleagues, or some colleagues in science rather, than um, in, say, sociology. I don't know about other, those are the disciplines I know best, but yeah. I think that here the, the, the problem is uh, stronger than, uh, than in the UK, because uh, basically you cannot talk about families that you know this thing. Oh, okay. <laughs> We had a lot of trouble to call the secondary families, include the word families in the right. secondary. Okay. So it's not just a question of biology. <laughs> well, it's not. Yeah, it's much it, you know, it's not that easy in the UK anymore. Yes, no, we, but uh, women's but studies is in studies. Here, it will exist. Right. There is no any degree of women's studies. Mm. For example. Has there ever been? Sorry? Was there? No. There never has been. No, I can't hear you. I can't agree. I mean, I think we do have women's studies. We do. Yeah. Yeah. Institute of Feminist Studies. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, uh, but it's not, it's not a degree, it's not a degree. It was not a degree. I was on the, I mean, my, my tutor from my, my, when I entered the PhD program in Computers University was in Salvemi, and she um, started a master degree on uh, women's studies and uh, equality politics. But what happened was that um, it lasted like two years or three years, then the, the government of Madrid changed and they became um, uh, right wing, so they cut her the money. And it became just a specialization, university specialization. So with less uh, credits and less money and everything. Yeah, there is some of the sorts. Yeah. Some of us have PhD. PhD. There yeah. are two PhDs going on there. Anyway, I wanted to ask you 
ask you, um, I had a training on feminist research. I had been working in feminist uh, research. Um, however, um, I mean, now I'm taking uh, over again a PhD and in here in Bombay Pharma. I work in the UK and there were some possibilities. <laughs> there were some possibilities. However, like, uh, there are certain professors that, I mean, it's, it's just, I think we can sue them, really. <laughs> because, I mean, it's, it's not a question of, well, it's a kind of academic uh, position. It's a position against human rights, honestly. I mean, nowadays, um, the Bologna Treaty or, or um, Pact or Agreement is saying that um, Universities should do this and that, etc. But they also should uh, teach um, uh, courses on human rights and on peace, uh, to, you know, to educate the people toward peace, etc. Uh, I also think they sh in this uh, basic legal framework, uh, they should, con they con they have to contemplate the fact that uh, epistemologies. Uh, uh, should have uh, should be free to be taught at the university. So you, there should be a freedom of, of teaching different epistemologies. I mean, I never really had that issue when I was at my university. I entered medicine school and I did not like it. And I went to sociology and they were doing many things there. Mm. Fine, but uh, I think that I don't know whether it's a flaw or what's going on there. Uh, there are really teachers that are against a uh, feminist approach. They really deny, like uh, two weeks ago on a PhD seminar, I have to say the name is uh, very known, it's Jostaspin Andersen, the guy from the United States. He is invited to Caladona to give talks, uh, talks etc. And he said the following <laughs> to a, a girl that is studying, he, he, she presented a project on. Um, dual earning couples and um, ways to arrange their um, how you say, um, housework. Uh, she said, he said to her, put away feminist ideology, you will get it wrong. Uh, they all get it wrong. <laughs> all that feminist stuff is wrong. <laughs> Uh, when there is an equal on sharing responsibility, uh, for example, he said that he is cleaning more and he is working more uh, at, a, at a formal job. Uh, he did not say formal, he just said he's working <laughs> uh, and making money. Uh, I mean, she gets more leisure time, so that's fair. Oh. Mm -hmm. I mean, I don't know. I, I, I think we should have a, a place to to denounce these things because that, that's very denigrating for mm -hmm. women. Um, if, if you have the chance to have it in the UK, or uh, what can we do? I mean, but you get those those kind of arguments all the time. I mean, there was that example of yeah. um, the president of Harvard a few years ago, mm -hmm. Lawrence Summers, saying that you know the, the reason we don't get more girls doing. Um, maths and engineering is because of these public and determinants basically they're less capable of it genetically. So that was only quite recently, um, about four years ago, five years ago, something like that. It happens all over. Um, it, yes, I'm sure there are some examples in the UK too. It's just there are going to be those very reactionary people, and they, of course, they, there is a kind of social. Um, push in that direction as well. For example, the British University, the British Research Councils now have to include all sorts of complicated impact statements. Basically, you know, is, it going to be of a, is this research going to be of any economic impact? Well, as soon as you start putting all those justifications in, you retrench things in the disciplinary boundaries. And the more that things are stuck in disciplinary boundaries, the harder it is to ask feminist questions. 
So it's, yes, I think that things have gone. There are many ways in which things have gone backwards. <laughs> But that doesn't mean to say we should stop. Yeah. I have absolutely no intention of stopping asking awkward questions. <laughs> Can you give a few more examples of steps backwards? In oh. the UK, for example, steps backwards. You're saying in the UK, uh, well, the, the pay differential has gone, has got bigger. Really? Yeah. So the relative women's pay and men's pay, I don't know the exact figures because I don't follow that in detail, that kind of stuff. But yeah, apparently it, it has got much worse. I think it was very good at finding ways around things. Mm. Yeah, I was listening to something on the radio the other day. Yes, it's, got, it's actually got worse over the last 20 years. But everywhere, not just in that. I think, I think yes. There are more women's representation in the media. Yeah. Worse and worse and worse. So we were more about the operations and more yeah. about the superficial things and ideas and yeah. more and more. Sure, and of course it interacts with an increasing um, disparity between the rich and poor in the UK since we had, since we had our only woman prime minister a few years ago. Um, you know, that really set the country back and uh, you know, so the disparity has grown since then. Of course that has huge impacts because the poorest of the poor are very often women. Um, not all, of course, but, uh, you know, the impact on poor women is particularly great as that differential. Uh, so there are probably more women below the poverty line than there used to be. So I don't, I'm not good on the exact statistics because I don't do that, that kind of sociology and feminism. But apply your ideas to the field of physics. <laughs> and when you show one well, well, slide with the feminist criticism to biology, science, you said it's relativist, mechanistic, context, ignorance, feminism, and I forgot the requirement of physics. <laughs> <laughs> this is not a feature, this is well one in a physical theory. And then I thought about I think that comes from physics. There has been a criticism of those ideas coming from thermodynamics, chaos sure. theory, but this comes from, I think, the physics made by men mainly. And I don't see in some way this is feminist, but I don't see the difference really. So the, the question is, maybe the, the criticism you are making, maybe you can do it without being famous? <laughs> or is this essentially feminist? Is it? No, it's uh, not it's essentially feminist. Um, and yes, of course, I, you know, I'm a biologist, so most of what I've said is, first of all, it's primarily about biology. Secondly, it's primarily about the way in which biological ideas percolate through to the public sphere. It's often about the popularization of scientific ideas that are through society. Um, and third, I absolutely do not think that it's exclusively feminist, that those are the ideas are exclusively feminist. I'm trying to say that I think that that kind of more, less mechanistic, less reductionist approach fits better with my feminist soul, if you like, <laughs> than with the, the, the very reductionist approaches which are, in which I've been trained. But that's speaking in, as a biologist. Of so course there are aspects of physics that are quite different. Then what do we do in physics? <laughs> yeah.
But I think that the, the point is that we are questioning about the, the power relation between the investigator and the investigated. Mm -hmm. And in this case, this is feminism. And I think we uh, need to be um, orgulloso, proud, mm -hmm. proud of that, or proud of that, because um, I, I, um, I saw you making a lot of questions about uh, is this a feminist investigation or uh, uh, can you speak about feminist science? And I think we are need to be proud about the, to put on the table the power relations, to put on the table the what did you say? The subjectivity, the empathy with the with the animal or the person that you are investigating. Yes. And this no physics made before. Sorry for that. But perhaps they they question the context and the interdisciplinarity, etc., etc. But we have an added value, and we need to be proud of that. And we yes. need to say yes, this is feminist, because if not, it becomes against us also. Yeah. And yeah. um, I think, uh, yeah. And uh, for me, I like too much uh, the sequence of your thought when you are analyzing the way that you are making the, 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 the way that you analyze if this is feminist or not because it's participative, because it's, um, uh, yeah, you know, you make, because also we are very, uh, we use too much to put all in a single yeah? Yeah. But perhaps <laughs> we can think about it in another way, eh? Not yeah. uh, so, yes. Uh, I think we are very perfectionist. Yes. <laughs> yeah. And What's I think we need to be more, pff, yeah, eh? No sé. It's difficult. <laughs> but, yeah. I think we need to say, yes, this is feminist. This is yeah. feminist because we are questioning the relation between the investigator and the investigator. And this is all. Yeah. Yeah. I agree. Yeah. yeah. That's why before when you said, when you were answering there, I thought, well, why disguise the fact that your research has a feminist tinge? Don't disguise it. No, I'm not saying. If you don't disguise it, more and more women and men who consider themselves feminists are going to um, make, maybe make you know, some break in the institution of universities in general. But you know, I understand the problem. I do understand the problem. If you don't have feminists or um, people who um, can understand you when you're doing your research, your, what you call them here, uh, the, your supervisors, um, they, they need to be with you and say, well, be proud of who you are. This is what you're doing, go ahead with it. But if you say, well, I can't do it because then they're not going to give me my PhD, then you're compromising your own um, person, I think. Yeah, yeah I apologise if I gave that impression. I, what I was trying to say was that I, I, I think you, could, you have to do several things at once, which is not the same as saying I'm choosing to go like that. No. No, I also think that you have to see some contradiction, and uh, I think that there is a strong power relation, and we can assess to everybody to do the same. Sure. So, if you, if you are studying in an area where there is nobody that is feminist and you are trying to do your PhD, it's better you do it with a feminist perspective without saying that it's feminist at the beginning. And you say, well, we're finished, and you say, oh, it was feminist. <laughs> <laughs> because, because otherwise you cannot do it. So I think that it depends. And uh, yes, this is a question of strategy also. So sometimes I think that we have to be proud to be feminist, obviously. but. Uh, that doesn't mean that everybody can be proved in the same way and that our relation exists and uh, cross our bodies. <laughs> and also because it's, it's the way you can go through other ambits, and not only feminist ambits, 
Because for me, it's not only important that um, people who think the same things um, as I as I'm thinking, they treat me. Okay, it has no value for me. It has also value. People are not thinking this feminist way in the sense I'm doing. They could read me, and if I want, they read me. I must publish in these kind of reviews. Uh, many times not accept some kind yeah. of, of approaches and, and but I also think we have to we have to be proud but we also have to look after ourselves. And if we're being confronted with the kind of person you were talking about who said feminists are simply wrong it's a waste of time and energy. And I have so much energy, I actually want to put it into positive projects for feminism or positive projects for thinking about animals, not wasting my time talking to idiots who are just completely clinging to <laughs> So if, if that's how I choose to, to make my alliances, then yes, then I do. But I, yes, I, I, what I wanted to say to you was that you have to do several things at once. But talking, talking to people who just think feminism is rubbish, that's a waste of time. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes you're surprised when you're talking with this general public, and you're surprised when you speak about these things, somebody says, okay, I think it's, it's not a bad idea. Perhaps we can go that way. And but give, if somebody gives me an argument, I don't have to agree with them. But when some, I mean, that was a very good example, just saying feminists are wrong. Where is the argument? Thank you.